keep uh, Marcia in there uh, uh, in, in your prayers as she's got the COVID right now. So, so keep her in your prayers. If you need an outline for today's message, hold your hand up. Dick will give you one. It's in Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And uh, it's amazing. Uh, whenever I'm in a book of the Bible, after I'm in it a while, I said, this is my favorite. And uh, I have to say, Luke is one of my favorite books. And, uh, and you say, well, preacher, you keep saying that every book you get to. And pretty soon it's your favorite, too. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of the way it is with devotions. We get into a book and you really start studying it. It should become something that's a blessing to you. And it's certainly a blessing to me. Uh, we're looking at a passage of Scripture where the Lord is using uh, his time to instruct his disciples. And in the book of Luke, the way the outline is, uh, there are uh, certain passages passages where it's um, it's it's uh, spoken to many and other times it's specific and uh, this is the case here uh, he's been teaching his disciples and uh, uh, much of of uh, uh, chapter uh, 11 uh, has been a time of teaching it's uh, uh, he's been teaching his disciples how to pray uh, he talked about them about Jesus and Beelzebub he taught them uh, about the unclean spirits he taught them about signs and and lights and uh, the light shouldn't be hidden and he denounces uh, and, uh, uh, a hypocrisy in the church and so much of uh, that we've been looking at in chapter 11 has been dealing with instruction to his disciples and uh, that continues here and, uh, uh, and we're here now we're in verse uh, 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 Luke chapter 11 as uh, in, uh, our, uh, we got done with that. I got to turn over here. We're in Luke chapter 12. It continues. A teaching continues into chapter 12. So this is a very long passage where he's dealing really with teaching his disciples a lot of different subjects. We're in, uh, uh, rather than going through it all, let me just get to where we left off here. We're dealing now where he's teaching his disciples to be a watchful servants in verse uh, uh, verses uh, uh, 35 uh, uh, down here here for through verse 48 so that's what we're looking at here 35 through verse 48 might not get to it all but he's uh, uh, instructing specifically here about the future things and I'm going to read a portion of this passage and then we'll look at it I love preaching through books and uh, because uh, when you put books together you you understand you're looking at the teacher of teachers and the method of his teaching is to preach methodically through a rather long passages sometimes because he's uh, teaching and uh, it's been preserved for us this way so he's teaching now about being watchful uh, uh, and uh, part of that watchfulness is going to be dealing with future things you can see from your outline uh, so verse 35 uh, uh, Luke chapter 12 let your lights be girded about and your loin and your your loins be girded about and your lights be burning and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he returned from the wedding that when he cometh and knocketh they may open unto him immediately blessed are those servants to whom the Lord when he cometh shall find the, uh, them watching verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them and if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so blessed are they that are those servants and this uh, know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would have come he would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken into be ye therefore ready also for the son of man cometh at an hour that you think not then Peter said unto him Lord speakest thou this parable unto us or even and to all and Jesus said who then is that faithful and wise steward whom the Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season blessed is that servant whom the Lord when he cometh shall find himself doing of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath but if he that servant say in his heart my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to beat his men 
the men servants and maidens and to eat and drink and to be drunken the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him in an hour that he's not aware and will cut him asunder and will appoint to him his portion with the unbelievers and that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself neither did according to or nor neither did according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes and if he had not uh, and uh, did commit things worthy of stripes he should be eaten with a few stripes for unto him that much is given him shall be much be required to whom a man have committed much of him they will ask the more and uh, let's pray father I pray uh, your spirit's power upon this stammering tongue allow me speak with great speak with great clarity and uh, may your people hear an exhortation here a wonderful exhortation from your word about the fact that you're coming and about the future things as they unfold they unfold for us as well uh, Lord help us to understand these things and uh, and follow the exhortations in Jesus name amen uh, we have at the beginning here in uh, verse number, uh, uh, as this begins in verse 35, uh, let your loins be girded about and your lights be burning. Now he's been, uh, uh, the Lord Jesus has been giving a series of exhortations here. And uh, this is a, a parabolic saying that begins here. And the subject here is the Lord's return. Uh, we're praying for the Lord's return. The Lord is going to come someday. We believe we're going to hear the voice, the sound of the trumpet, and we're going to be caught up together to be with him in the air. And that's going to introduce another period of time uh, that's uh, related to the tribulation period. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is our waiting right now, uh, the church is waiting, and uh, we are his servants here. We're to be serving here. And we're waiting for the Lord to catch us up to be with him in the air. And you say, well, does that mean we're going up to the heaven? Well, I know. I guess so. The heaven says the air. Let's just leave it at that. We're going to meet with him in the air that during that time there'll be a time of tribulation on the earth, but we're going to be with him. And uh, he's teaching his disciples that need to, they need to be ready for it. They need to be prepared for this catching up. Well, what does this mean? What does this catching up mean? Well, it's a parabolic saying, meaning that you need to be ready for this because following the catching up the, uh, is going to come judgment. It's going to come a time of rewards for believers. And, uh, and the exhortation is, is that we're to be watchful servants. So he's instructing his disciples uh, uh, to be ready. And that literally means to be watchful. Verse number uh, uh, 35 says this, Let your loins be girded about and your lights be burning. Uh, now, uh, we need to be ready for the Lord's return. And you say, well, what does this have to do with the loins being girded about and our lights be burning? Well, uh, the implication he's going to come at a time of darkness. That certainly appears there, doesn't it? Your lights need to be burning and your loins need to be girded about. Now, girding up the, the, the loins, uh, uh, in those days they wore longer uh, dresses, or not dresses, but robes. And to gird up their loins, they would take their robe and they would tuck it back into their belt. And they would gird up their loins so they could move about freely at work. Uh, now we got pants now that's even better. But uh, uh, it's easier to work in a, in, in a, when your loins are good, when your pants, you're not wearing a dress. It's just easier to work, physical work. The exhortation is strong here for Christians that we need to be working and uh, our lights need to be burning. So the Lord says, when I come, I want you to be actively working, serving me, and I want your lights to be burning. Uh, uh, now, that, of course, that carries on twofold exhortation there, doesn't it? Uh, working and, uh, and watching. And uh, uh, so let me ask you just about that. Uh, are you a working Christian? Are you, are you laboring right Right now, are you are your loins girt about as if the Lord could return this day? Uh, I, I would hate to think that the Lord would return and there were things that you had left undone that you should have done. Uh, somebody said, "Well, well, if I'd have known the hour, okay, well, let's just take that and expand upon that for a second here. If you knew, if you knew the Lord was going to return at three o'clock this afternoon." 
the rapture was going to take place and we were going to be caught up in the air three o'clock in the afternoon this afternoon the Lord's going to catch us up and now some of you some of you godless people are wondering about the score of the game you shame on you it's not about a football game here the Lord's coming the Lord's coming and we are to be ready. But if you knew the Lord was coming at 3 o'clock this afternoon, are there some other things that you need to get ready? Are there some things in your life that need to go? Are there, there some good things that you need to do? Uh, maybe you're, at, you're, at, you're at, uh, at, at have issues with a family member and you haven't talk and, talked to them in years. Would it be nice to make peace with them before the Lord returns? Maybe you've got a child that's lost and going to hell. Wouldn't it be nice if you could share the gospel with them before the Lord returns one last time? You know, there's a lot of stuff that we put off because we don't have a keen awareness that the Lord could come at any moment. Our loins need to be girded about. We need to be doing the things we're supposed to be doing when the Lord returns. Well, don't you want the Lord to find you doing the things you should do when he returns? So what's it going to be like when he returns? Well, the Bible says the voice, the shout, we're going to be caught up in the air and be with him immediately. Boom. There, we're in his presence. Would it be nice if we were doing the things we should be doing when the Lord returns? Uh, you know, there's a lot of things we could do that, uh, quite frankly, are so, so, so unimportant. We need to be ready. So first, we need to be working. We need to be working. We need to be doing the things that God wants us to do. And I think one of the things God wants us to do is tell other people about Jesus Christ. I think God wants us to be peacemakers. I think God wants us to bring harmony to family members and to do the things that we need to do. I think God wants us to do good works. When's the last time you did something that extended beyond your own family? Are there other people that have needs? Are there other people that have, that have special needs that you could be helping? Or does your generosity stop at your front door? Uh, sadly, some people's generosity doesn't even reach their front door. It stops at their bedroom door. They just take care of themselves. So I want to ask you that. If the Lord was coming this day, this day, this day, are, are your loins girded? You know, I can't think of a better thing I would like to do when the Lord returned and stand right behind this pulpit preaching. What a day that will be if I could, he could catch me preaching. Oh, man, that'd be wonderful. But you know, it'd be wonderful to be having family devotions when he comes. It'd be wonderful doing a lot of things that we should be doing. And, and uh, uh, so are you ready? And then second, we need to be working, therefore our Lord is good about, and our lights be burning. So not only should we be working, we should be shining, shining. One, uh, uh, one fellow said about the shining there, carries the idea, we ought to be witnessing. We're to be lights in this world. Do you know that a lot of people are living in complete darkness when it comes to God? Complete darkness concerning truth. There's a lot of young people today that grow up in dark homes. That are filled with anger and, and ink and people are getting and fighting with. And, and things just aren't. And, 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 uh, and listen, we need to be shining in our home. We need to be shining to the stranger. When I think of the shining, I always think about sharing the gospel. I think about doing good things to others. And that word shining there, let, let your, uh, be, your lights be burning. I like that word burning. It's almost stronger than shining, isn't it? Burning means on fire. May God find us on fire for him. So we need to be working, and we need to be shining 
And then we need to be watching. Look at verse 36. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord when he return from the wedding, when he cometh, and knocketh, they may open to him immediately. In other words, they are watching for the Lord's return, and they're waiting for the Lord. They actually believe the Lord could come at any moment. You say, well, preacher, I just don't have that sense of, of watching as if he could come at any time. And he's not, he didn't come yesterday, uh, but you know the scripture tells us he's going to come at an unexpected time. And he tells us that we need to be watching for his return at any moment. Do you know there are people today, uh, matter of fact, people that are, uh, let me, I don't know how to word this in the right way, I'm, I'm going to try but there are people that look at the signs of the times we're living in today and they come up with a conclusion the Lord could come at any moment. You know, there's not a single prophecy that needs to be fulfilled before the Lord returns. This, this, this world, He could come at any minute. And we need to be watching like they're waiting for that immediate and imminent return. And we ought to be waiting as if he's our Lord. You know, I know some Christians that are waiting for the Lord's return, but they, they don't wait for him as if he's their Lord. They must wait for him as if he's their enemy. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, there are some Christians that really don't want the Lord to come right now. They don't want that sudden return. They got things, listen, friend, when we've done our best, we've done enough. Our focus need to be upon the fact of the glorious return of the Lord Jesus Christ as something wonderful. And we need to be watching and watching for your Lord's return. You say, well, what's the significance of that? Well, you know, I know a lot of saved people that are saved, but they really haven't made Jesus the Lord of their life. The Lord's not the boss. They're still the boss waiting for their Lord's return. Are you waiting for your Lord's return? Is He your Lord? Have you made Him your Lord in every aspect of your life? So we need to be working, we need to be shining, we need to be watching, so that when He knocks, they might immediately open the door, as He says there, that when He cometh and knocketh, they may open unto Him immediately. Immediately. It's kind of an interesting thought, isn't it? Do you think there's some people that are going to say, oh, I, I'm sorry, I, I, got, I got something I've got to do. I've got, to, I got, I got this I've got to do first. That speaks about the priority of our life, isn't it? And friend, whether you like it or not, if you're saved, he's coming, and when he's coming, he's there. You don't have a choice on the matter. And, and so you need to understand something. You need to be working. You need to be shining. You need to be watching. And you better beware because he's going to come whether you like it or not. And we want to be the kind of people that open the door immediately and say, even so come, Lord. Somebody said, every prayer we pray should end with the words, even so come, Lord. I don't pray that way. It'd be a good thing they have it to get into. Because quite frankly, we're to live as if the eminent return is just that. It could be at any moment. And it could be at any time. And it could be sooner than we think. And from say, well, it might be a while yet. Well, listen, you could die right now. He could, your day with the Lord could be right now. You know, you're not guaranteed you're going to make it back to Sparta. You're not guaranteed you're going to make it. You're not going to guarantee I'm going to reach the end of the service. <laughs> I remember preaching up at St. James. That was my first church at St. James and a Manor Baptist Church. And we were preaching and my wife was thinking when I said that, you never know. Uh, we had the opening song. We had the opening song and I heard this noise. I heard this noise. And I looked to the back, and people were smelling around in, in the back seat, just uh, uh, right about, well, actually, right about where Zach is sitting. I'd move if I was you. Uh, right around where Zach was sitting. And, and I couldn't see her. She had fallen over sideways in the pew. She was dead. And uh, uh, whew, 
I got out from behind the pulpit and I ran back there and, uh, and uh, she was laying there sideways and I ran back to my office in the front and, and called the 911 and said we got uh, come immediately and I came and I got back there. In the meantime they'd pulled the, the chairs out of the way and there she was laying flat on her back. Uh, bowels had really, she was wet and she was just lifeless. And I, I literally jumped on top of her. <laughs> I literally jumped right on top of her. I was leaning, I was squatting right over her, and I started the heart massage. And I said, somebody start doing mouth to mouth. Somebody start doing mouth to mouth. And, and uh, one of the other visitors in the church that was came from the school, she started doing the mouth to mouth resuscitation. And we kept doing this and waiting for the ambulance, you know. And uh, I don't know how long it took, but you know, probably eight, 10 minutes or whatever it took to get there. And uh, they came in the door, the back door of the church, and the thing flung open. They came in the back door of the church, and, and I heard the lady, because uh, I'm doing this, and I'm looking up at them coming, and I, I heard her grab her pin here and say, code blue, code blue. <laughs> and she came over and pushed her, they pushed us out of the way, and they put her on a gurney, and away they went to the hospital. Her husband sat in the seat behind her. He was very nervous, too. We went to the hospital. And I, I, obviously, I went right away, too. We were there, and uh, uh, probably about 15, 20 minutes, they come out and said, there's a pulse, but it's very weak. There's a pulse, but it's very weak. And I prayed with her husband, and we waited and waited. But you know something? It wasn't her time. It wasn't her time. She recovered completely. She recovered completely. She outlived her husband. She lived like 20 some years after that, didn't she? It was over 20 years later she lived. She was like in her 90s when she passed away. She was in her early 70s when this happened. And I talked to the doctor, and the doctor, who was a Christian, said, he said this to me, he said, we've never had a patient. She had a massive heart attack on the frontal lobe. And he said, we've never had one come back. And there she lived on and on and on. But you know, it wasn't her time. It wasn't her time. You said, well, that was quite the experience. We know something. It shook the whole church up. <laughs> shook me up. And you know, I spent several, uh, I said many, many days with that, uh, with her husband at the hospital, sitting with him. And, and you know, there were some issues there that I had, and boy, I'll tell you what, after this was all over, he would have given me the shirt off his back and probably taken half his possessions to give it to me if he could have, because he knew that God had used me to help his wife at a real key time. And you could see I really cared. Now, the Lord could come at any time, but we don't know the time. Now, her time, it looked like it was her time, but it wasn't her time. When the Lord comes, it'll be everybody's time. Not just one person in one sitting in one church in one pew. Everybody that's saved is going to go boom. There's not going to be an ambulance that comes. It's just going to boom, we're gone. And it's a scary thought to think at that time. There's some people going to be left here because they've never asked Jesus Christ to be saved. Amen. And it might be somebody that we thought was saved and they weren't saved. And uh, friend, the Lord knows the heart. The Lord knows the truth. The Lord knows the beginning and the end of all things. The Lord could come at any moment for us. And uh, you know something at that time? It's going to be a wonderful time if you're ready. But he uses that term in verse 37. Blessed are the servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find them watching. Verily I say unto he shall gird himself and make them sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. Now listen, here's a wonderful truth. He said, blessed are those servants when the Lord cometh, he shall find them watching. And I said before, if the Lord comes, if the rapture comes, I hope he comes when I'm up here preaching. Because uh, I, I'm at different places during the week and my feet aren't quite so clean as they are right now. If you're a Sunday school teacher, I hope he comes when you're teaching Sunday school. If you're just a housewife, if you're just a dad, I hope he comes while you're having family devotions. 
I hope he comes when we're doing the right thing. But we can't count on that. But you know what the real right thing is? Though in Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, every time is the right time. There's no wrong time for the Lord to take home somebody that's received his son as their personal Savior. And we need to be watching. And we need to be watching. And Jesus is telling his disciples, be watching for the Lord's return from his wedding. Now, listen, these disciples were going to, Jesus is going to get crucified. Jesus is going to rise again. But quite frankly, they're, for the most part, are going to live out their life. And it's still, he's not come back for them yet. The Lord's return, the rapture has not taken place yet. But Jesus is speaking prophetically when he says this. He said, And ye yourselves liken the men that wait for the Lord, and he returned from the wedding. When he cometh, he knocketh, they may be open immediately. And he said, Beware, be careful, be ready. So we need to be working, we need to be shining, we need to be watching, and we need to understand the Lord is going to be bless his servants at his coming. And if the Lord finds his servant watching and working, what does he say in verse 37? He said, Blessed are those servants, when he cometh, find them watching. Verily I say unto you, he shall gird himself, make them sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. Wow, what a thought that is. If the Lord finds us watching and waiting and eagerly looking forward to his coming, and we're doing what he wants us to do, when the Lord comes and takes us, he's going to take us into his presence, and the Lord cometh, he find them watching, he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. Oh, man, now if he's speaking about himself here, by the way, he's given the this exhortation to his servants, the disciples. He said, blessed are those servants. And he's going to come forth and serve them. I can't comprehend that. I don't think I could get off my knees. I don't think you could get off your knees. I, the Lord might want to have us sit down and him to bless us. And I guess we'll submit if he does that to us. But listen, we need to understand that when the Lord comes, we need to be watching. And then he gives another exhortation in verse number 38. And if he come in the second watch, or the th come in the third watch, and find them so blessed are those servants. And this is a warning, meaning that, that the time of his coming could be at any time. Not necessarily the first watch, or the second watch, or the third watch. But he needs to find us so doing, doing the right thing. And listen, I know it's been a lot of years since Calvary. And I don't know what we would associate ourselves with today. Are we in the second watch? Are we in the third watch? I don't know. But I know that when he comes, it's going to be at a time that's unexpected. Look at verse 39. And know this, that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to uh, get broken into. This know, that if the good men of the house had known that. So he says in verse 40, Be ye therefore also ready. In other words, you don't know. I don't know. Some of you know that there are some preachers that have published books saying they know. Well, I want to tell you something. They don't know. They don't know. And if you want me to find out, I don't know. And if you tell somebody, if somebody tells you they do know, tell them, well, according to this, you don't know. No man knows the exact time of his coming. But we can all know that he's coming. The Lord is going to come. And a matter of fact, he says this in verse 39, Know this, that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken through. Therefore, uh, be, verse 40, be ready also, for the Son of Man cometh an hour that you think not. In other words, you need to be prepared, and listen, you won't know. No one knows. But the Son of Man says we're to be ready at whatever time he does come. What does that mean? You need to be prepared. Prepare thyself for the coming of the Lord. 
You say, well, how can I prepare myself for the coming Lord? Well, number one, you better be saved. He better be your Lord. And number two, we've already seen what you need to be doing. What you need to be doing. We need to be watching. We need to be waiting. We need to be serving. We need to, we need to be doing all those things. Uh, working, shining, watching. We need to be doing all those things. We need to live as if the Lord could come at any minute. That's the, that's the wonder of the scripture. And by the way, the same exhortation that he gives me is the same exhortation he gives everybody else. Every Christian needs to be doing what? Working, shining, watching. And why? Because we're to be ready also for the Son of Man cometh an hour that you think not. I don't think there's anybody. We, and somebody said, well, I think now. Well, uh, you don't know, though. You might think it, but you can't know it. And of course, that parable is for all of us at verse 34. Then Peter said to him, Lord, speak us this parable to all of us, uh, to, unto us, or even unto all. So Peter says, okay, so you know you're talking to us, right? Or you're talking to everybody. And the Lord says, well, I'm speaking to everybody. And he words it in a, in a unique way. In verse 42, look at your text there. Luke 12, 42. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom the Lord shall make ruler of his household and give their portion in the season? And the Lord said, Who then is? And he says, uh, Blessed is servant. When he, uh, uh, in verse 43, uh, was the Lord cometh, he find himself doing so doing. So if we're doing those things... So Peter says, is this uh, an inquiry just for us at all? And, and the Lord uh, thins it down. He said, whoever is a faithful and wise steward to whom the Lord uh, maketh ruler of his house and give their portion. And so in other words, it's for all people that will be wise and faithful stewards. So let me ask you something. Are you a part of the faith? Are you faithfully doing the things that God wants you to do? Now, don't ask me and don't tell me and tell the Lord. Can you honestly bow your head and say, Lord, thank you that I've been faithful doing everything you've wanted me to do. You know, you know every day is almost a day we have to go to bed and pray and ask forgiveness for the things we didn't do. That way. But you know, we should start our day saying, Lord, what would you have me to do today? And we should end our day saying, Lord, is there anything I forgot to do? Can I do better tomorrow? We need to, be, and you know, that's what a good steward does. That's what a good, uh, matter of fact, if you're going to have a steward, hire a steward to work for you, that's the kind of steward you'd want. You'd want your master to say, uh, 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 end the day and say, you might want to come to him and say, is there anything else you wanted me to do? Is there anything else you wanted me to do? I've worked in factories, I've worked in, uh, as a foreman, I've worked as an employee. And, and uh, you know, if I, if I got a fellow working underneath me, and I was a foreman for a period of time, very young age I was a foreman, uh, I, I might add to that. I was working in a factory, and I, I think it was about 20 years old when I became a foreman at the factory I was working in. I had, I had a lot of guys working underneath me. And, uh, but there would always be a few guys that would come and say, is there anything else that you wanted me to do? Not very many. But you know something? Those were the very ones that became group leaders very soon. Those are the ones that I appreciated the most. Those are the ones, those are the Christians that God appreciates the most. Those that come back to the Lord. Is there anything I forgot to do, Lord? Is there anything I could have done better? Is there anything you want me to get prepared to do tomorrow? Friend, what does the Lord want you to do tomorrow? Do you pray that prayer? Oh, what a prayer. Man, what kind of wise and faithful steward. Are we faithful and a wise steward that uh, the Lord's going to reward by making us ruler over his household and then he gives us their portion of meat in due season? That's the reward. So who is it then? Well, I guess first it's the, for the faithful. Second, it's the wise stewards that may be living up to their responsibility and, and seeking uh, to do all the Lord wants them to do. And the reward is, is he's going to make them ruler uh, over the house. He's going to give them positions of authority and also feed them in due season, their portion of meat, their reward. 
I think that portion of meat has more to do with the reward than just the meal. And so the Lord speaks now in a prophetic way. Blessed is that servant uh, whom the Lord cometh, uh, when the Lord cometh, he find himself doing. And the Lord shall make him ruler. And cursed is the servant. Now we have the blessing. Now look at the curse. But that servant that saith in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. He shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens and eat and drink and to be drunken. And, uh, uh, and now that servant uh, uh, that we're talking about there is the unfaithful steward, the unfaithful servant. And he's the one that says, I don't think the Lord's coming. I'm not going to worry about when he comes. I know Christians that when you exhort them about doing right, will say, well, we don't know when he's coming anyway. They really, they might be saved in their head. I'm not sure if they're saved in their heart, but they have an attitude like, uh, uh, he's, he's not coming now anyway. I'm just going to live my life. I'm just going to, I'm here. I'm going to live my life. I'm going to enjoy life. And enjoying life causes him to, to mistreat men, servants, and maidens, eat, drink, and be drunk, and all, all sorts of fleshly things, and all sorts of things that our God, God doesn't want for him to do. And yet, Jesus gives this exhortation, verse 46, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him. In other words, the person that's got that attitude uh, that uh, uh, he delays his coming and he starts living for himself and living like the devil, and that person uh, is, uh, is not a faithful steward. And so for him, the Lord is always going to be unexpected. You know, uh, I could say it like this. If you live in expectation, uh, how can I say this in a nice way? Ladies, if you live in the expectation uh, that company's coming, your house will always be clean. <laughs> right? And, and, and you know something? Quite frankly, we need to live as if our Lord could come at any time, in meaning that we always keep and are doing the best we can at what, what He's given to us. We tend to the things that have been entrusted to it, and we do it the best way we can. And we certainly are not going to mistreat others, or, or just uh, uh, we're going to live looking for him. And he says this in verse 46, That servant, uh, the Lord of that servant, will come in a day when he looketh not, uh, at an hour he's not aware, and he'll cut him asunder to appoint him a portion of the unbelievers. So all those things, he's going to come when that servant's not looking. He's going to come at an hour, exact time, when he's not aware. He's going to then, uh, and the servant uh, will then be cut asunder, and that servant will be judged. And I'll appoint him, it says in verse 16, uh, his portion with unbelievers. No reward. By the way, uh, unbelievers get no reward. Now, I got news for you. There's some saved people are, are going to get no reward either. And I think that's being referred to slightly here. Because we know some people that have been saved, but they've been living for themselves, for themselves, themselves, themselves. They won't get a reward. Why? Because our God is a just God. He's going to do us right. You mean a person can get to heaven and not have much of reward? You know, uh, heaven is a, 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 enough reward. Uh, God doesn't have to, it shouldn't be expected God to give him any more than that. That's a wonderful reward. Now the tragedy of that day, verse 47, and that servant which knew the Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Now the tragedy and the judgment is a loss of reward, but there's another tragedy that appears to be here. Uh, uh, he shall be beaten with many stripes. Now, you say, well, this is an analogy to the lost. Maybe. I've mean, I got to ask you this. I've got to face this. When a Christian lives willfully outside of God's will and is doing things that he shouldn't be doing. When the rapture takes place, they goes and stands before the Lord. 
Will there be any re recompense to that? Will it just be a loss of reward? Or will there be some chastening? Well, I'm glad you know, because I don't know. I just know what the scripture says right here. And, and I think sometimes we've got to base what we believe by what we read in the scripture and not on what we think. I think, I think there will be no punishment. But I read a passage like this. Uh, makes me feel uncomfortable. Makes me feel uncomfortable. And quite frankly, you know of people that are say they're saved and have done terrible things to their wives and you believe they're saved or their children but will God give recompense you say preacher do you know that no all I know is what the scripture says here does that frighten me yeah it ought to frighten you too we all ought to live in fear of the Lord fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom fear of the Lord is, is a healthy thing not a bad thing the tragedy and the, and the judgment here is verse 47. That servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to will, shall be beaten with many stripes. In other words, this is not, a, this is not going to be a punishment that for somebody that didn't know better. This is a punishment that awaits those that know better and don't, don't do better. Well, oh, I don't know. But uh, the rapture at the end of these, I don't know if that applies for them. Okay. Right, uh, that, that, that's your opinion. You've got that right to that opinion. I kind of I lean in that direction too, but when I read this, I think I better watch myself. I worry about myself. Amos chapter 4, verse 12. Therefore, thus I will do unto thee, O Israel, because I will do this thing. Uh, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. If we're not prepared and we're not doing what God wants us to do, is God just going to wink at that in the final judgment when we stand before the Lord? So while all that's been taken care of on Calvary, yes, the wage of sin is death. That payment has been paid, and you don't have to worry. You're not going to lose your salvation. But is there going to be a chastening if that's not dealt with here on earth? Well, all chastening ends when the Lord returns. Okay. If you believe that, that's fine. But if you believe there's going to be a purging, or a chastening of Christians because of the things they've done wrong. I don't know that. Certainly, it was a just condemnation in this parable. That servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither according to will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Verse 47. For his sin was willful. Verse 48. But that he knew not, and did commit many things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whom much is given, to whom uh, much shall be required, to whom uh, uh, men have committed much, of them they shall ask more. Now that verse there kind of puts it together. He that knew not, and uh, did things worthy of stripes, he shall still be punished, but not very much. What is Jesus talking about here? If he's not talking to his disciples, what are they asking him about? When shall these things be? He's talking about when these shall be. And why will he be punished? Because he uh, knew the Lord's will. Was again, he was doing things he shouldn't. He will receive many stripes. And unto whom much truth is given, much shall be required. Verse 48. For unto whom much is given, of him shall much be required. And of whom men have committed much, they will ask more. In other words, the same truth is in the interaction between men as it is between God. Oh man, I hate passages like this. Because it just reminds me that I better clean my act up. I better try to do as much as that the right I can all the time. That's why Christians need to end their day in prayer. Amen? None of us have truly measured up to all we should be. And our God is merciful, full of mercy. We're under the blood. Praise God, saved. I preached the message that might have made some people uncomfortable here today. Quite frankly, it makes me uncomfortable. But you know something? That discomfort 
if it causes me to get on my knees and pray and ask forgiveness for my shortcomings and ask for help for future victory, then the passage of Scripture will probably do what it was intended to do all along. Cause Christians to keep their accounts with the Lord short. Jesus told these this to his disciples, all part of a long sermon. And uh, this is the book of Luke. This is not the book of Clyde. <laughs> and it's not the book of you. It's the book of Luke. It's what God recorded in his dealings with his apostles. It's an interesting passage. It's a troubling passage. But it has great truth for us. There's a scripture verse that says this. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now some people say, well, if I get saved, there's no more fear of the Lord. Well, in light of the verse we looked at today, let me give you a little wisdom. Fear of the Lord <laughs> is the beginning of wisdom. And may us as Christians that know Jesus Christ our Savior have a great reverence toward the fear, to fear the Lord, for he is faithful and just, and he will always do its right. I love my children. And when my children were naughty, my love didn't stop, even when I gave them a spanking. And God's love is faithful and he loves us and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom for saints well let's pray Father thank you for yourself and your son kind of a quiet time right now as people reflect some of the things we're looking at here it's a awesome thing to consider what you taught your disciples it's a little difficult for us to comprehend because it just seems that all of us have naturally assumed that, that some of the things we're talking about are, are all reserved for the lost, that you don't uh, hold your own accountable, but, but you do. And quite frankly, most of the chastening that we endure will be in this world. It won't be in the world to come. Uh, uh, the Lord chastens his children, and, and, uh, and we understand that after we're saved. And it might full well be that the, that the rapture at the time we come, the, that's all over with, but it might not be. Lord, uh, I pray you'll teach us from your words some great truths from this that'll help us to walk with you as we ought. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our song here is page number...